Hello fellow problem solvers. So today we're going to be continuing this series on my final weeks at Brown. And again, if you haven't seen this, if this is your first time, the whole point here for you is that you may, uh, one, get an idea of what college life at Brown is like, or two, that you might learn something from these classes that I'm taking, because what I'll be doing here is I'll be doing an overview of what I've learned in my classes at Brown. So now without further ado, let's begin with the first class. And the first class is privacy conscious computer systems. So what I did here on week four was we had a, everybody did a case study on uh, GDPR violation. The case study that my partner and I did was about Vodafone Italia, which violated GDPR by doing aggressive telemarketing practices. Aggressive actually is a value statement here, but what they did basically is they were doing telemarketing, customers, some customers complained about the phone calls they were receiving and they said, hey, don't call me anymore, do not use my data, and Vodafone called them again. Like somebody from Vodafone called them again, and then this was a GDPR violation because customers have the right to request for you as a data controller, somebody controlling their data, to not use their data or to delete their data which if you're calling them again and again you're not and they told you not to call them then you are in violation of that as a data controller so that it was the violation we did and Vodafone was fined a couple of million euros for that violation now in week five what we did was we read uh, first we read a paper on do cookie banners respect my choice so this paper was looking at cookie banners across websites that are from the eu mostly and it was looking at which of these websites implemented this transparency and consent framework, which was developed by the IAB or the Interactive Advertising Bureau Europe. Basically, after the GDPR, advertisers saw, wait, we will not be able to have such good targeted advertising, which really helps us sell ads if it's targeted, ads are more effective. And if users just like start not allowing us to track them across websites and develop these profiles on what they like, what, they're, what they are like and what they like so that we can do targeted advertising for them, that will impact our bottom line. So they came together and created this transparency and consent framework, which, was, which is used in some web banners, like some cookie banners are using them. And what this paper was exploring was, do these cookie banners respect user choices, like they're implemented differently? And what are the viol are there any potential GDPR violations that are happening with these cookie banners? Because they found, I believe, that some, like 50% of websites had at least one out of four violations they figured out. I'll put them down here. I forgot which ones they were. And it was an, just a paper exploring that in general. Then we read a New York Times article, which was looking at how websites track you across, how these cookies are tracking you across different websites, or how advertisers are tracking you across different websites. And finally, we read a paper on data flow assertions. Basically, the thing was, you want to make sure that your programmers, when they're coding up an application, a web application, that they don't send data to people who should not get the data. Basically, for example, you can think about a password or some, say you have your medical data on a database and you don't want, the website doesn't want to just like send that to some rando, somebody who doesn't have access, who should not have access to that data. And this paper was trying to do that by creating a runtime language uh, or language at runtime to specify who is supposed to get this type of data or that type of data, or to like force programmers to specify uh, when they're creating objects to specify who's allowed to access them under what conditions and whatnot, like what is the policy that you're allowed to be accessed and whatnot. I did not pay too much attention during class on this one. I was focused on other things. And that is class Privacy Conscious Computer Systems, week four and five. So now let's go to the next class. So the next class we're going to be talking about is deep learning and genomics. And I'm going to break this down in week four and week five. Week four, class one, we did a paper called Dan Q, which was talking about, it was a hybrid convolutional, convolutional and recurrent deep neural network. 
that was trying to quantify the functions of DNA sequences. So the thing is, you have the, the goal of this, as they say, is a lot of you want to see when there's some changes happening in the DNA, how will that relate to functions of the, how will that change the function of the DNA? How will that change, say, the whether some histones are present or not, whether some transcription factors are be ab able to bind to specific sites or not. And they were also very curious about, I believe, non-coding regions of the DNA, which are regions of the DNA that do not, are not used in the production of proteins. I could be wrong. I'm going to have a disclaimer here if I'm wrong. And what they were also, and the reason they are looking at, into this is because 98% of the DNA is non-coding and it's associated with 93% of disease associated variants are also there. So that's why it's important. And they were looking at that. They thought a convolutional neural net, like a convolutional layer gives you a motif, sort of gives you an ability to understand not just a single letters, but like groups that are close together, which creates some motif. And this recurrent neural, this recurrent layer is allowing you to understand the impacts of motifs in one place on DNA in another place, and then you're able to predict functional capabilities. They had an improvement over another method, which was trying to do the same thing, which was a paper that we read on week three, and which just used convolutional neural networks. And that was class one, then class two. We did not have a class. We just needed to meet up with our final project partners, which is a sort of a quasi research paper that we're doing, like a research project, uh, a group research project. And here we met up and we decided to focus on, focus our attentions, like work on this competition on NeurIPS, on single cell modality matching, which is saying this, you basically have um, two different types of measurements in the same cell. So you have a set of measurements which are measuring, say, gene expression, and uh, then measurements which are measuring uh, gene accessibility. And some of these are from the same cell, like, not some of these, like, they are, there's there's a measurement from cell one here and a measurement from cell one here, and you're supposed to match which measurements are from the same cell. So that is sort of what we we're going to be working on. Week five, what we did in class one was we said, hey, we're going to read this paper, Kita, which tries to solve the problem with deep neural networks on how, given you have a DNA sequence, how will that DNA fold onto itself? Can you predict that? And they're trying to predict this using deep neural networks, a convolutional neural network to predict this. And they had some promising results. They could do this also across species when they train on one species, their DNA, they could do it across species, they claimed. And they could also have some downstream predictions from there. And then on the second class, what we did was we read a paper called, called Deep Crow, which was looking at histone modifications. And histones are, from what I know, these things that the DNA wraps around with, or things that are connected to DNA. The biology is still hard, but the way I'm dealing with it now is I'm just saying, okay, this exists. Let's look at the deep learning that's happening. Okay, what is the input? What is the output? Okay. And they're looking at how these histone modifications impact the expression of certain genes. And it's like you have these five histones they were looking at, whether they were present or absent in a DNA sequence. And they were looking at whether a certain gene is expressed or not, a plus one or a minus one. They used, I believe, a convolutional neural, neural network here to predict, and they showed they were like the first paper that did this. Also interesting, this is a paper by the professor. So it's interesting that you can ask a professor why they did the things they did in the paper. That's always a very cool thing. And now moving on to the third class. So week three, what we did here was we had a midterm paper on the first part of the class. So there was a thing the professor gave us, a sort of situation, a story, that we were supposed to add things to the story to make it part A. Have it be, a, have justified true belief classified as knowledge incorrectly, and but have justified true belief plus no false grounds accurately classified as not a case of knowledge. So in this example, there was a painting. It says Claude Monet. 
this person sees, it says Claude Monet, says, oh, this is a painting by Claude Monet, and then infers that this is a painting by a French painter. Now you can make it a justified true belief by having it not be by Claude Monet, but another French painter. It's true, it's justified, um, but it's not a case of knowledge. You got lucky that it's by a French painter. It's by some other French painter, uh, but it doesn't fall, it doesn't get classified as an instance of a and of knowledge, if you're having your definition of knowledge be justified true belief plus no false grounds, because the false grounds are that you inferred from this thing uh, that was written next to the painting, Claude Monet, that this is a painting by Claude Monet. So those are your false ground, and ergo, this is not a case of knowledge. And then the second part, part B, was let's make it no false grounds, part classified as knowledge incorrectly, but adds something to the story such that no defeaters, the no defeat just by true belief plus no defeaters doesn't classify it as knowledge. And here you can add something along the lines of things were shuffled around, you know, these like a person just like decided to shuffle around these labels on different paintings. And it happened to be that this one actually was by Claude Monet, but by sheer luck, most other paintings are not. And then the intuition, like the premise here that we're working with is that this isn't a case of knowledge, uh, but it is, it's not on any false grounds that this whole thing, that this painting is by a French painter that it's based on, it's just, it is by Claude Monet, these are correct grounds, but you got lucky sort of, if you went to another painting next to it and did the same process, you probably would not be lucky. So we wouldn't say this is a case of knowledge, but it's not a case of knowledge in case of the no defeater clause. And then we added part C, add something else to the story to make it a make it non-defeaters, the non-defeater clause not work. Again, misclassified as a part um, as an example of knowledge. And this was a thing I did not fully understand. I kind of winged it, uh, and I was like, oh, I don't know what I'll, what I'll get here. And then we had a part, a second part to this was to look at one of these theories of knowledge, like these general people who are looking at, these people who are looking at how can I, who are looking at the whole sort of goal to say knowledge is true belief plus some X and say, hey, this ain't gonna ever work no matter what you pick the X. And that's what I was looking at. Uh, the professor that I was working on, I'll just put the, I'll just put in the video description like what the paper was, and the whole point was, whatever you make X, you will never satis you'll never be satisfied with it. You'll never have a perfect thing, a, per a thing that perfectly classifies things as knowledge or not knowledge. Because you can always create these sorts of get problems, which are, you have a true belief, but the basis on which you came to the belief was a lucky basis. Like you got lucky once, you got unlucky, and then your unluck was um, canceled out by a case of luck. So, for example, they, you, the, fact, the idea that sh the, the professor uses in this, like the author of the paper uses to talk about her theory is that, say you're, you, come to, you come to a doctor, a doctor runs some tests and says, oh, this, you have a disease X. Unbeknownst to the doctor, there's a new disease not uncovered, it's disease Y that has the same symptoms as X and even maybe like gets all the positive tests and all the negative te tests as X does. But then it happens to be that this person also has the disease X, but it, they have it, but it, they don't have it for a long enough time for it to be detected by the test. So then it's like, and they're creating this sort of like a general framework to make this X, no matter what you put it, if it does, that, that if you say it won't imply truth, then the whole idea is if X does not imply a true belief, then you can create these sorts of get your problems where you would not classify things as knowledge. And that was epistemology. It's difficult. And now moving on to the next class. And which brings us to the class persuasive communication, weeks four and five. So what we did in week four was we first had a, we first did a, in the first class of week four, we watched an impromptu speech by former students of the professors, namely Joe Gibbia. 
And after watching his speech, we did an impromptu speech. And the reason we watched his speech first was because he, after t like five or more years after taking a class, came back to the university, gave a talk. And in that talk, he said that he still remembered his, the professor's rule for an impromptu speech, which is make a point, support a point, potentially support it again, and then restate the point, the four step rule for making impromptu speeches. After that, we did impromptu speeches ourselves, meaning somebody would give us, like two students would give a topic, we would choose one, and then on that topic, we would give an impromptu speech, make a point immediately, support it once, maybe the second time, and then restate the point. After that, we went on to the second class, week two, where we looked at visual, we looked at not just visual, but all sorts of sensorial aids. What are the pros and cons of using them? They can maybe enhance clarity, but you might have a problem if they fail to work, and that's why you need a backup if you're ever using them. We looked at different ways to present and different sort of tactics. It was more of a tactics-filled lecture. Then in week five, class one, we did a lecture on neurodiversity, classifying that as not a disorder, but a difference of ability and how to maybe talk to those speakers. I did not fully understand what we did in that class. What the, There wasn't a lot of messages that I got from the class that I could really see how I can apply aside from a sort of maybe mindset shift. And then in the last class, the second class of week five, what we did was we talked about how we are going to do a speech to teach, that you have like two types of speeches to teach, a speech to inform what, like what is true, or a speech to instruct, which is how to do a specific thing. For example, how do you cook is a speech to instruct the effects of climate change on um, oceanic di diversity of life is a speech to inform. And the differences in those two speeches, what you should look for, how you want to set your thesis up. And we also looked at answering questions, how we answer questions in general. If you feel like answering questions is easier than giving a speech, think of your entire speech as a series of questions that you're answering was a good tip. And also answering hostile questions. A lot of tips with that. My favorite one being is if somebody asks you a question that's very emotionally charged, ask them to repeat the question. Because if they repeat the question, they might take some of the venom out of the question, as the professor said. And that seemed like pretty cool. And if all else fails, you know, appeal to the audience is also an option of something that you can do. So that's been persuasive communication. And after that, there's one more class, which is Maths 100 which is like the second semester of calculus class. We had an exam and the way you do these exams is you, well, because it's an open book exam, mind you, you can use your notes, open notes exam. It might mean you can print out anything you want before the exam and use it. And the way I did this exam was because I don't know the level of depth that people want me to go into when making a proof is we got a bunch of practice exams that the professors gave us and solutions to the practice exams from like free practice exams and free sets of solutions. So I printed out all those solutions and the exams. And after that, when I took the actual test, it was a matter of pattern matching. Okay, there's this type of problem. Let me find a similar problem with different numbers or different, um, maybe a different function that the same type of problem. Okay, I found it. Let me see how they're writing up a solution. Okay, they're writing it up like this. Let me translate that. And it was literally just that, just a, a thing of translation. And that's how math 100 went. And finally, we have the job search. This was actually very slow. I only just began doing that. And the thing I scheduled was I scheduled a call with a person from the career lab, sort of how to structure this job search. And the, one of the main pieces of advice is that you want to spend time reaching out to people from the Brown network, basically asking them for tips, advice, maybe open positions that are not advertised. 
so that you can find opportunities like that. And that's and that is the weeks four to five in my last semester in Brown. And as always, thanks for problem solving.